Our gospel reading today has the risen Christ popping up to visit friends again. Jesus turns up among the disciples again, and they are again amazed. Unless the reader suspects this is merely a ghost story told around a campfire, Jesus takes and eats a piece of fish in their presence, proving that indeed their beloved friend and teacher Jesus is there, and he's hungry. Luke 24, 36 to 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see that I am not a ghost because ghosts do not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of a broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still here with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer, to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. There's something really appropriate about that passage of scripture landing on our camp Sunday. Of course, when they laid out the lectionary, they didn't know that that was going to happen. And we didn't even intentionally pick this Sunday because it had that scripture, but it works really well. There are many places in the gospel where Jesus turns up after the resurrection. He appears several times to his disciples and others, and he always has his wounds. This is how they always know that it's him. And that kind of makes sense, right? Anything worth doing leaves some kind of an imprint on our bodies. We all tend to come back from camp with a skinned knee or a stubbed toe or a sunburn. I'm not suggesting that Jesus' ordeal was anything like a week at camp or vice versa, just that life tends to leave a mark. And Jesus doesn't let the disciples forget that. But what makes this story of the risen Christ so appropriate for Camp Sunday is that Jesus shows up hungry. If you've ever spent time at camp, you know that people get hungry. How many times a week does a camper ask, when are we having a snack? How long until dinner? When we're moving around, we use a lot of energy, and sometimes when we're having fun, we forget to eat until we're starving. Jesus is hungry in this passage, and his disciples, in their astonishment, have failed to even offer him something to eat. In first century Judea, this was unthinkable. You would always offer someone food, water, maybe wine if you had it. That was just expected. So Jesus might be hungry, but he's also using this as an example to remind his disciples that they have failed to show him proper hospitality. How we welcome one another, 
how we engage with each other, how we extend hospitality is one of the greatest things we learn at camp and in the outdoors more broadly. If you really listen when you go outside, you feel that all of it feels like a sort of welcome, a red carpet being rolled out. At camp, we get to spend a few days, maybe even an entire week, practicing how to respond to that welcome, learning and thinking and practicing how we can be that kind of community to one another, listening to the natural world. The trees, the lake, the wind, the sun, the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air all call us, reminding us that we belong to the places we love. God's spirit dwells within our bodies, these bodies that get hungry, that feel the sunshine, smell the fresh air in the trees, and splash in the beautiful lake water. You know, Pam, you probably know a lot more about Incidson than I do. You certainly do, uh, both factually and experientially. You've been there a little over a year, and so you've seen the water and the wind and the earth and the fire go through an entire cycle of the seasons, and I'm hopeful that you can share with us a little bit about how you, just a little bit about how you've experienced that. Where have you seen God's okay. spirit in the fire? Yeah. Ooh, okay. So we're going to start with fire. Um, and I am what is called a fire personality. So I am always like sparking and flaming and I have so much energy around ideas and around being with people. I'm definitely an extrovert. So I see the fire not only in our campfires when we can, um, you know, have our campfires lit or where we're all going to see the fire in our brand new fireplace insert in Forester Lodge this year. That's all done and ready to light the first fire, but I see it in relationship. When I meet someone that is as excited or more so about being at Incidson than I am while I'm there, I can see it spark. I can see the ideas come to life. Uh, we are very fortunate to have a whole new full-time staff member. Her name is Chelsea Nesbitt, and Chelsea has that same fire idea that I do. And so when we start talking about, let's do this and let's do that, that's where the fire sparks between us and the relationships are built. And that's one of the most important things that I think happens at Intidsen, and that is relationship. And you can end up going to camp with somebody you've known forever, and all of a sudden, when you're there this one time, a whole new relationship will spark. And that's the fire that I experience. And that's how, to me, is one of the many ways that the spirit shows up in fire. Well, the next element I'm thinking about, Pam, is the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you would know how many acres, how much earth uh, in Sitsin is, but it's a pretty big, yeah. it's a pretty big place with a lot of opportunities. Where have you seen God's spirit moving in the earth? We have what uh, Randy probably knows is better than I do, 243 acres. It's close to 250, 270. Oh, I like it even more. And the place that that I connect to the earth is when finally it's warm enough. It's maybe not quite warm enough to go in the lake to get the baptismal water, but it did anyway. But it's definitely warm enough to be running around in my bare feet in the grass. And that whole idea of grounding. So we stand in our bare feet in the grass and just stand still. And when you're in that place, you can, I can just feel that spirit show up. It, it's like, here I am. This roots you down in, and then it also helps to grow and nurture you up out. So you can feel that connection to the place, and you can feel the connection of the generations that were there before us to the place. And it's a practice of grounding, which I hope everyone has the opportunity to do that, but it's also a practice of being present in the moment to feel those roots go down in. This year's theme for summer camp is linked by love, and we're also using it for the women's retreat as well. And the t-shirt design is based on the root system. If you were to walk south on the beach a little ways, and I know we can only do that when we're accompanied by an adult to go south on the beach, you'll see those great big um, petrified root balls 
and we take turns putting little stones in there in heart shape. And that is what inspired our t-shirt for this year. It's, it's the linked by love idea. And that link starts in the earth. And when we stand there on that earth, on that ground, in that sacred space, it just feeds our whole body. And then we are rooted and we're able to grow and reach out to bring others who've never experienced it, to bring others back who haven't been there in a really long time, or to join with those who are regularly um, present at Incidsense. So the earth is sort of the place where it all starts. Hmm. I love that idea of just standing barefoot in the grass and connecting. It's, uh, and I love that we have a place where we could do that because here in downtown Spokane, it would be a little bit harder to really feel grounded and, and comfortable walking around barefoot. Um, but I'm wondering, I, when I think of Camp and Sitson, one of my favorite things is that sort of calm morning when you hear a very, very gentle breeze. And if you're lucky, sometimes you hear the call of a loon, uh, which always just transports me. I'm wondering what good news you've heard on the wind uh, in this year. Yeah, and, and the loon is the place I wanted to start that because yesterday I heard them back this spring for the very first time. The dogs and I were on the porch just having some downtime and the breeze was blowing, very gentle breeze. It was like 67 degrees in the sun and the loons started to call. So the loons have returned. And that's the thing that the air brings to me is the sound of the birds in the morning just as the sun is starting to rise. I wake up to this beautiful prelude of songbirds and they sort of sing me awake in the morning and then I'll go and sit and yesterday morning I sat with my coffee and a mama robin was on that front porch of the director's house looking to see if maybe she was going to build her nest there and so the sound of her chirping sort of singing I'm sure to the other mama robins who are also building nests right now came to me and that's what it reminds me of is this beautiful prelude of bird song that we wake up to almost every morning at Incidsen. Um, and I love the hymn, um, When Morning Gilds the Skies. And that's what I think, that's what comes to mind in that morning song of the birds. And then the other thing that the air does is it brings me the smell of the wood fire when we're allowed to have them. And I told my granddaughter Cora one day when she was there with me, I said, do you smell the wood smoke? And she said, no, but I smell marshmallows. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, that's so wonderful. So the air brings us. And that's, that's where the spirit shows up. The spirit shows up by giving us that morning prelude. The spirit shows up by reminding us of what it is to be around that campfire with our friends, roasting the marshmallows, enjoying the s'mores. And as the spirit moves, our excitement moves. As the spirit moves, we're called to just sit in the stillness or we are called to join together in song or we are called to take a nice quiet walk in the woods so it's just letting that spirit move over us in the form or shape of air that we breathe in and what comes out of that is different for everyone and it is such a sacred way to simply be in that place mm. Well, Pam, I, in my mind, the lake kind of steals the show. And so I, I didn't want to make any of the other elements. Of course, all of the elements are important and they follow and balance each other out. But I didn't want to make any of them follow the water because I feel like the water for many of us is sort of the, the star mm -hmm. of the show. Where have you seen God's spirit at work in the waters at Insidson? So when we sit on the lake shore, the it's one of the calmest lakes and i grew up on lake erie in western new york state which is a pretty rough lake and then we have a smaller lake called chautauqua lake and that's a, a pretty calm lake that can you know stir up a storm but what i love about um lake Coeur d'Alene is it is so calm and still that it's actually a treat on the days when there's any movement in the lake at all and we get little waves up on the shore because what those waves remind me of is the idea of change so if you were to 
gird your loins before the 1st of July and sit in the lake, because <laughs> it's a little nippy right now, and let those little mini waves wash over you. And you looked at the stone underneath the water. Every time the wave comes in, the stones move just a little bit. And that reminds me of how we are called to change and how the Spirit calls us to adapt to different things, different ways and change in our lives. And when people come to Nsitsen for a visit or a stay and they'll happen to bring up in conversation that they're in a place of change in their lives, I'll say to them, just go and sit down by the water and watch how when that water comes in, it has the strength to move those stones a little bit each time. It'll flip them over so you're seeing a different side of the stone, or it'll flip it enough that you see a completely different stone. And that's how change is in our lives. It's just, you, we adjust to it a little bit at a time. Sometimes a huge change will come along totally unexpectedly, and we have to adjust in the moment. And then in order to really let what is changing settle in, you do that sitting in the water and watching how the water just gently moves and guides those stones to be moved over or moved under or flipped around a little bit. And that to me is where the spirit really shows up in the water. It's just that gentle whooshing back and forth along the lakeside with those little tiny changes. And sometimes if we can just put ourselves in that place and remind ourselves that the Spirit is with us, the Spirit is going to walk with us, the Spirit is going to lead us, or in my case, sometimes the Spirit has to push from behind, but a little bit at a time and, and let ourselves adjust to change in our lives a little bit at a time. And that's one of those beautiful sacred things that can happen for you in this place to just come and be, just come be present and watch that water move those little tiny stones a little bit at a time. And that's how our bodies and our minds and our spirits, our souls adjust to change is one little thing at a time. It's kind of like eating an elephant, one little bite at a time. And then you're not as overwhelmed. The calming of that water on that lake is just so phenomenal. What a beautiful gift that we have in that space. That reminds me of the, I was, I've been told that if you down by where the uh, campfire is at Insidson, there's a, a ledge underwater where rocks break off mm -hmm. and they're very, they're really good skipping rocks. They're flat and they're kind of sharp and they get sort of little by little over time, they get tumbled farther and farther up towards the waterfront. And if you go and to the waterfront, the stones are pretty smooth by then. And who knows how many eons it's taken them to move up that way. It's, a, it's always a reminder, the, uh, the sort of geological time uh, is a nice, nice shift from our sort of frenetic pace. Well, um, Pam, I wanna thank you so much for sharing your reflections. And I also want to thank you again for bringing this water. Uh, this is living water, right? That's, it's, as opposed to the water that comes out of the tap, this is living water. This came out of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Was it this morning or did you gather it last yesterday. night? You got yesterday, but it's, so it's still got some life in it. So it was moving and sort of changing those stones little by little. Um, as you know, we have a practice of baptism in this church, and uh, many, many of us have been baptized. And I want to invite all of us for whether you've been baptized or not, if you've been baptized, you can come and just touch this water and remember your baptism. Just remember that you are beloved. If you haven't been baptized, you can touch this water and you can just remember that you are part of this beloved creation. Everything, all of life, it seems, begins in water. We see that imagery in baptism. We see it in birth. Uh, we see it at the dawning of creation. Our story tells us that the world was a great watery expanse before God called forth all that is. Uh, and so I just want to take a minute to let us all come forward, if you choose, uh, and just, just to touch this water. It can be the first time you get to touch Lake Coeur d'Alene this year. Um, and it can just be a reminder of the way that water and community and place, uh, like those little stones, can work on us and move us if we're open to it. So come on forward if you'd like. <laughs> 